If only we could have a day of news without talking about the virus which shall not be named. So, uh, today's not that day. Let's just jump right into it from CNET.com. We'll be living with masks for years. COVID-19 through the eyes of a pandemic expert. Since the summer of 2019, I've been speaking with one of the world's leading pandemic experts about what a global outbreak could look like. Now, as the world enters a grim new phase, he says we're in a whole new ball game. Eric Toner has been planning for a pandemic for years. He's briefed world leaders on outbreaks and how to best prepare entire nations for mass casualties. He simulated epidemics in real time and studied the world's response to major global health emergencies like SARS and the 1918 influenza pandemic. But nothing could have prepared him for how the COVID-19 pandemic would play out. I need a better dramatic voice for that line. Toner is a senior scholar at the John Hopkins Center for Health Security and a world leader in pandemic preparedness. The threat of a novel coronavirus is not new to him. In fact, in October 2019, Toner and the team at John Hopkins ran a coronavirus pandemic simulation in New York months before COVID-19 started spreading across the world. As part of the half-day tabletop exercise, Toner met with other health professionals to walk through a theoretical coronavirus outbreak and examine how governments and private businesses would respond. Now, I, I, for a second here, I imagine this guy hearing me kind of mocking this story and going, but Adam, statistics, statistics, statistics. And I go, yeah, and lies, lies, more lies, and damn statistics, right? So with all of the misattributions of deaths with corona, with all of the lies and distortions, you know, I, he's going to say, okay, but just in case then, yeah, and it's like, no. I, and I, I just want to make my position clear here because I think this is even as I'm going over it, helping me understand just, you know, what is an appropriate response to this is that, you know, we, we know some basic facts about the low mortality rate of this virus. We know that it's somewhere on par with, uh, you know, a seasonal flu. We know that all of the freak out and dramatization is an overreaction not an underreaction. And part of the fear and uncertainty and doubt that's being spread is based on making you feel uncertain. But you have to remain certain about that which you know to be true in order to see through the fog. And one thing we know to be true, the mortality rate is very, very low. We also know that the people who are lying and distorting what is going on here are not underreporting, they are overreporting. There is no incentive to downplay this. Yes, okay, Trump wanted to say that he was right. Look, I downplayed this at the beginning, but he's not anymore. He's playing into the whole game. So those are two things we know for certain. Third thing we know for certain is that in the way that this is a reboot of the economy, it is extremely effective at serving the agenda of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. And you know that at most, if you have some vulnerability or you have some vulnerable person in your life, the most that you should be doing in order to respond to this thing is upping your hygiene game and your physical distancing, not the social distancing, not limiting your economic behavior. We know these three things for absolute certain. And I think that should help us see through all of this nonsense. So if, if the masks forever is really a thing, well, we're going to get over it eventually. Eventually, people will calm down or we'll have you know, ways of controlling our viral exposure without, that, without this. You know, and maybe, maybe we get bullied into bubble boy world or hazmat suit world. I you know, realized or figured out as this thing was starting, there is kind of a worst case scenario. We saw China manufacturers even reaching out to me because I got my books printed in China going, Adam, yes, we can send you masks. And you go, wait a second. Was this whole thing set up so that China could sell us more 
you know, cheap manufactured goods, right? And PPE. No, that that's not the biggest conspiracy here for sure. There are greater conspiracies that have led to an addition of at least $9 trillion of liquidity into that into our system. So uh, back to the, the story from Cena. John Hopkins has run these simulations for years with Hollywood sounding code names like Dark, Dark Winter for smallpox and Clade X, a biologically engineered, intentionally released airborne pathogen, which caused hundreds of millions of hypothetical deaths. The goal of the simulations is to help public health experts and policymakers better prepare for the eventual day a real pandemic arrives. Now that day has come. Uh, all right. As he says about countries failing the test, Toner, quote, the U.S. response has been extraordinarily disappointing and wrong-headed. Whenever there's been an opportunity to do the right thing, we seem to have done the wrong thing. The U.S. has to recognize that it is competing for first or second position of the worst affected country in the world. Now, I mean, like, yeah, all of these, like, really, are their problem. Oh, you say that to every country, don't you? Uh, you know, I, I just, I, I hear this, and I, and, okay, so the next, here's, the reason I wanted to get into this story is looking ahead. So that one of the further down sections says, there will be no lull. This is important to keep in mind, whether you know the truth and your neighbors don't or your neighbors do. If, if your neighbors don't understand what is being done to the world population right now, the whole global human family being bullied with these fear mongering tactics, then they're not going to respond rationally. And you have to be ready to say, all right, people are afraid let us at least respond rationally who can. So many countries have seen success in the fight against coronavirus, locking down early, moving quickly to adopt World Health Organization's advice and ramping up diagnostic testing to identify and isolate localized outbreaks as they surface. But as the Northern Hemisphere entered summer, hopes of flattening the curve in the U.S. soon ran up against reports of Cases continuing to rise as states reopen. Tone of those quick to talk down any mention of a, quote, second wave. Quote, when you're underwater, it's really hard to tell how many waves are passing over you. I don't know whether it's a first wave or a second wave. I don't think it makes any difference. There is a resurgence of cases that in some states looks like just a continuation of their outbreaks. In other states, it'll look more like a second wave. I think what's important is that there's going to be no summertime lull with a big wave in the fall. It's clear that we are having a significant resurgence of cases in the summer and they'll get bigger and it'll keep going until we lock things down again. Unlike the influenza virus, which was behind the 1918 pandemic that claimed as many as 50 million to 100 million lives around the world, Toner says there's no good evidence of seasonality with COVID-19 until we have a vaccine. Any rise or fall in cases will be based on social factors, communities locking down and families sheltering in place. And as was the case in, back in 1918, individuals wearing masks. Now, based on, now this is, I mean, there's an obvious fear mongering lie. I just I got to pull out of this. Uh, until we have a vaccine, any rise and fall will be based on social factors. It has nothing to do with the virus itself. So I guess the mutations that we're supposed to be afraid of are irrelevant. This is now just part of the, like, which just I go, goes back to my point. Like, this is just part of the global human petri dish right now. So, I, there, experts agree that it will be at least a year from now before we have a vaccine that's accessible to most people. Mass immunization won't like likely won't come until twenty twenty two, and even then, Toner says vaccination may require a double dose to be effective. And until then, I think mask wearing some degree of social distancing, we will be living with, hopefully living with happily for several years. You know, and this is something I, I would say I'm, I'm actually, you know, as, as a bit of a germaphobe, you know, I am, I am glad that we are, you know, actually having a slightly higher hygienic consciousness. You know, and this is this is actually this is a, a good thing. I'm not I'm not I'm not worried about this. 
And when I, when I see the response, you know, I mean, we're going to, we, we've got some good news and we've got some bad news. I mean, first we go from the Associated Press to Egypt. Egypt arrests doctors, silences critics over virus outbreak. A doctor arrested after writing an article about Egypt's fragile health system. A pharmacist picked up from work after posting online about a shortage of protective gear. An editor taken from his home after questioning official coronavirus figures. A pregnant doctor arrested after a colleague used her phone to report a suspected coronavirus case. And we can look at Egypt and be like, wow, I'm glad we live in America where we have freedom of the... Ah, oh, crap, never mind. We have rampant internet censorship. Look at... Look at what this channel represents on YouTube. CJ, our producer, calls this the most censored channel on YouTube with a quarter million subs and, you know, nothing for views. You would go, wait a second. You know, and if you mention Corona, even on YouTube, you have to check a box that put the, oh, well, if you're not one of the official authorities talking about Corona, you might be spreading misinformation and therefore your video is unsuitable for advertising and isn't going to be promoted among the YouTube algorithms where we're going to push the propaganda instead and push you out. So there's a subtler way that the, the government has achieved the same effect. You know, it's not, oh yes, it's it, it, the government of Egypt is bad and America's government is good. It's not like, oh yeah, no, we have we have the righteous, moral, upstanding, respectful of individual rights government in the United States, and they wouldn't do that. No, the fundamentals are the same. They just they're better with the technique, they're better at hiding it here. They're more effective at manipulating people subtly. Without the violence, well, and it's maybe, maybe not they're better. I mean, they just like they've been forced to evolve to this with, with a certain level of accountability. They can't get away with the, this kind of overt crap that they do in Egypt so that they have to be a little more subtle in the United States. Eh, eh, that could describe it. So as Egyptian authorities fight the swelling coronavirus outbreak, security agencies have tried to stifle criticism about the handling of the health crisis by the government of President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi. At least 10 doctors and six journalists have been arrested since the virus first hit Egypt in February, according to rights groups. Other health workers say they have been warned by administrators to keep quiet or face punishment. One foreign correspondent has fled the country fearing arrest, and another two have been summoned for reprimand over professional violations. And we see similar things around the world. Well, this isn't going too far to the Jerusalem Post Coronavirus clubs, bars, cultural shows, and gyms closing immediately. The country passed 30,000 coronavirus cases on Monday. By the way, another headline we saw, uh, Drudge Report this morning ran with that uh, a bunch of headlines about England opening up on their first day of uh, semi-opening up where pubs were open that turned into massive street parties and, and drinking in the streets. It had to be you know, parties that were... Uh, unauthorized and had to be shut down by the bobbies and they you know have this weird state now where in england as i understand it and who knows could be changing could be varying by municipality but at least there was one point at which pubs were open and gyms were not really 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 government of england really oh okay so back to israel the coronavirus cabinet met on Monday to determine the next steps to help stop the renewed spread of the novel coronavirus, approving a series of new restrictions effective immediately. Clubs, bars, cultural shows, and gyms will close, and synagogue attendance will be limited to 19 people. Late Sunday night, the health ministry was also recommending that synagogues be closed. However, the cabinet accepted the proposal of Interior Minister Airy Derry and decided to leave them open with the limited attendees. Quote, we are required to address the coronavirus pandemic on the ground, said Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at the start of the meeting. Quote, the plague is spreading. It is as clear as daylight. The numbers are rising steeply each day and with it, the number of severely ill patients. Today, there are about 90 severely ill patients, and that doubles every day. If we do not act now, we will have hundreds and possibly thousands of serious patients in the coming weeks. That is why we are required to take immediate steps. And of course, the irony is not lost on this Jew that the coronavirus, a virus, 
with a lower mortality rate than trying to spend a counterfeit $20 bill in Minneapolis is being used even by the government of Israel to justify lockdowns when they're, they're talking about the death rate. And I guarantee you they are going to be putting more effort into, uh, you know, changing policy to save lives from Corona than they would to save lives from the Israel-Palestine conflict. Certain sign of inhumanity here. Now, in crypto news from CryptoNews.com, Singapore invokes fake news law to defend migrant workers' tests. Singapore gover Singapore's government defended its stand on the testing of migrant workers the biggest cluster of its coronavirus outbreak, issuing five corrective decisions under its fake news law to media outlets and a local graduate club that carried comments by an opposition leader on the topic. The government is disputing statements by Paul Tambia, chairman of the Singapore Democratic Party, who spoke Friday at an election forum organized by the National University of Singapore Society, where he said authorities had actively discouraged testing of migrant workers, among other issues. The directions to the club, local broadcasts for CNA, the Online Citizen Asia, and New Narratif on Sunday would require them to each carry a notice stating that videos, a Facebook post, an online article, and an audio recording they had published contained false statements of fact. They all ran comments at the forum by Tambia, who's a senior consultant in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the National University Hospital in Singapore. With Singapore's election set to be held July 10 amid the pandemic that has infected more than 44,000 people in the city-state, the government's response to, the, to tackling the virus is said to be one of the defining issues in the polls. While it was praised for its earlier containment of the outbreak, the spread among migrant workers, making up more than 9 in 10 cases, has challenged the country's efforts. So this is just, we see all around the world that these, th this, this fear-mongering is being used as an excuse for all sorts of crazy things. And it, it, it does scare me. I, you know, I can only compare this historically, you know, to something like a world war where governments, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of as bad as war where governments are taking over the economy using fear as the excuse, right? It's not the enemy's going to kill you now. It's the virus might kill you now. And even that, it's <laughs> hard to believe, right? Uh, and it, or that it's a threat that justifies any of this. And of course, it doesn't justify, uh, and you know, like invading Iraq and Afghanistan. Did did nine eleven justify it? Even if the government narrative was true, no, it did not. And it's always like that with war. This is really a, a, a template of a crisis following war as a phenomena you know, more than anything else and you know control of the media as the you know with, with this is the excuse consolidation of economic power and of course you know the, the the objective is always the rich get richer the poor get poor kill off some of the uh, people we don't like you know but, but they don't really care about it because they don't want to kill people if, if the superclass didn't have to kill people like they, they, they wouldn't the goal is not murder the goal is exploitation they're willing to murder to do it you know, they would they would rather than let a million people live and and be just sort of wealthy, but not live like a king. They would they, they'll kill 100,000 so that they can have absolute control over the remaining 900,000 and, and live like absolute kings. Like that's that's the calculation, you know, that, that that represents you know where they're coming from in this. So to China and the Stanford Advocate or Washington Post via the Stanford Advocate. From uh, China, China detains a leading critic of President Xi Jinping. Chinese police on Monday seized the Tsinghua University professor and essayist Zhu Zhangrun, silencing one of the last voices within China's besieged intellectual circles who dared to openly and persistently criticize President Xi Jinping's leadership. Zhu's arrest in Beijing's outskirts came five months after he published a lengthy essay pleading with political leaders to conduct an open investigation into a cover into the cover up 
of the COVID-19 outbreak in Wuhan and reverse the country's spiral into tyranny. And go, wait, wait, wait a second. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Zoo. Um, when we look at China, even from the perspective of the tyranny of the United States right now, you are already like a few more rungs down that spiral. But okay, spiral into tyranny. We'll go with that. What began as a local outbreak was exacerbated by a political system that stifled whistleblowers and a rot that goes right up to Beijing. Uh, Zhu wrote in his February piece, which he predicted would be the last piece I write. Friends in Beijing, some speaking on the condition of anonymity for fear of repris reprisals, said Zhu was taken away early Monday, a widely circulated statement on social media from Zhu's friends, which could not be independently confirmed, said his home was surrounded. I, I can't say Zhu, Zhu. I don't know which way it is. I'm not going to say it a hundred times. Uh, his home was surrounded by 20 police officers who took him away and his computer. Tsinghua University's law department, where he taught constitutional law until he was demoted last year for his political writing, said Monday it was not clear about his situation. Beijing's public security department declined to comment. One friend who met him on Saturday said the professor was in high spirits as he gathered with friends after weeks of isolation. Zhu had been barred from leaving his home during the politically sensitive month of June, when some dissidents commemorate the anniversary of the bloody Tiananmen Square crackdown in 1989 but it did not seem to be under an unusual degree of pressure. But Zhu's arrest was not wholly unexpected coming at a time when the Communist Party is forcefully reasserting itself, not only globally over territorial disputes and its reach in Hong Kong, but also into domestic politics. The Kung Flu, still a racket in China used to consolidate power, so the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, which leads us to our next story from the Associated Press, Trump-connected lobbyists reap windfall in federal virus aid. Shocking, right? 40 lobbyists with ties to President Donald Trump helped clients secure more than $10 billion in federal coronavirus aid. Among them, five former administration officials whose work potentially violates Trump's own ethics policy, according to a report. The lobbyists identified Monday by the watchdog group Public Citizen either worked in the Trump executive branch, served on his campaign, were part of the committee that raised money for inaugural festivities, or were part of his presidential transition. Many are donors to Trump's campaigns, and some are prolific fundraisers for his re-election. As Mike Tanglis, one of the report's authors, said, quote, the swamp is alive and well in Washington, D.C. These lobbying booms that these people are having, you can really attribute them to their connection to Trump. Uh, shortly after Trump took office, he issued an executive order prohibiting former administration officials from lobbying the agency or office where they were formerly employed for a period of five years. Another section of the order forbids lobbying the administration by former political appointees for the remainder of Trump's time in office. Of course there were loopholes. They didn't mean for this law to be followed. Oh, silly. Did you really think that that's what was going to happen here? So, you know, before we get any further into the, the political implications of this, first, uh, CJ, did you get that link I sent you late separately? This is great. The Daily Caller has the headline, Farrakhan accuses Fauci and Bill Gates of plotting to depopulate the earth with coronavirus vaccine. The Nation of Islam leader Louis Farrakhan trended on Twitter on Saturday. That's how you determine if something's really, really actual real news. Uh, after he accused Dr. Anthony Fauci and Bill Gates of trying to depopulate the earth through the development of vaccines aimed at ending the coronavirus pandemic. CJ, if you scroll down to that article, thank you for pulling that up so quickly, you'll see the tweet from Tariq Nasheed, the Honorable Minister Farrakhan is spitting truth to power. Can we roll this tape, please? Two minutes and eight seconds. Thanks. 
Let's, Let's do this. To the African presidents, yes, do not take their medications. I say to those of us in America, we need to call a meeting of our skilled virologists, epidemiologists, students of biology and chemistry. And we need to look at not only what they give us, we need to give ourselves something better. So my teacher told me, don't speak for some, speak for the whole. And now I'm speaking for black America, for Hispanic America, for the Native American, and for those who are desirous of life. They're making money now, plotting to give 7 billion, 500 million people a vaccination. Dr. Fauci, Bill Gates and Melinda, you want to depopulate the earth? What the hell gives you that right? Who are you to sit down with your billions and talk about who can live and who should die? That's why your world is coming to an end quickly because you have sentenced billions to death, but God is now sentencing you to the death that you are sentencing to others. And if only everybody could hear that message, perhaps we are. Perhaps all of this is coming to a head of discrediting government as we know it today. A tool for the rich to get richer and the poor to get poorer. Is Minister Farrakhan correct in how far, how deep this conspiracy goes? He might be. The evidence that we have before us now is on that count inconclusive but in terms of the intent of the system that it is set up to take advantage of the rest of us so that the rich can get richer and the poor can get poorer and that they don't care about killing people who stand in the way of that goal oh that you can know with absolute certainty <laughs>